it might seem like a bit much, but it's okay. Uh, just, just take as much as you can handle and, and let the rest come a little bit at a time. Can you say amen? Yeah. Now, before I get started, I've got to tell you, number one, the praise team did such a wonderful, wonderful job. I'm telling you. I wrote down every song. We're going to be singing them uh, when I get back to Colorado Springs in my church. Um, and Sister Patty, I don't think I've ever heard you sing better, and I've always heard you sing great. I've got to tell you something. When I was five years old, I went to church the only time that I was ever allowed to go to church as a kid. Knowing me, you could understand why my mother never let me go back. Knowing me, you could understand why my mother never let me go back. But it was the only time I was ever allowed to go to church as a kid. It wasn't until I was a man when I walked into a church and accepted Jesus as my Savior. But as a kid in that one day in church and a Sunday school class, they taught from Psalms 121, and I memorized that day, Psalms 121. Five years old, it has never left me. It's always been there. And I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, Lord, I didn't know they made that in music. Why didn't I think about putting that into music? That is beautiful, and I want to thank you. I love that. Amen. How many, how many really enjoyed that? Amen? Now, I got to tell you, since, since this past Sunday was Father's Day, I don't know if you know, but in New Bedford here, there were four expectant fathers waiting in St. Luke's, St. Luke's, is that the name of the hospital here, if I remember right? My baby Jayla was born there. Jayla was born in St. Luke's Hospital. And uh, four expectant fathers were, were waiting, and the nurse came out with two babies to the first father, and she said, you're the, you're the father of twins. And he said, what a coincidence. I, I work for the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> and, and, and the nurse came out to the second father, and she said, you're the father of triplets. He said, what a coincidence. I work for 3M. <laughs> she came out to the, what do you mean it's a joke? I don't tell jokes. I don't tell jokes. <laughs> she came out to the third father, and she said, you're the proud father of triplets. And he says, oh, what a coincidence. Or quadruplets. He said, oh, what a coincidence. I work for Four Seasons Hotel. The fourth father's tearing out his hair, bouncing his head on the wall, and they tried to stop him. They said, what's the matter? He said, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about the covenant of the cross of Christ. Most people, most Christians today, should understand covenant, but the vast majority do not understand covenant. That's why we have so many divorces. That's why we have so many people that are in and out of the church, up and down. They don't commit themselves to anybody, to anything. They don't commit themselves to anybody because they haven't committed themselves to God. People don't understand what a covenant is, and they live by contract and contract alone. But as I said last week, a contract is made between Two people who don't trust each other, don't love each other, maybe don't even like each other much, but they're trying to make money together. And so they make a contract, and the reason the contract is made so that if you don't do what we promise to do, we're out of this and you're done. The contract is broken and you're going to pay me a whole lot of money. That's why people make a contract. But a covenant, a covenant's quite a bit different. It's made by people who totally love, totally trust each other. And that covenant is unbreakable. Now, there's a way to break it, but I'm going to tell you today how that's done. And if you break it, you're not going to be a happy camper. Let's go to the next. I know I'm supposed to use this thing, but I'm not. Uh, as I said, a covenant made between two people who love and trust each other completely. And this is uh, made to protect, uh, contracts are made to protect yourself if they're broken. But a covenant is made, it's made never to be broken. And so we're going to go to the old and new covenant, and we're going to talk about, uh, first of all, we talked last week about God's covenant with Noah, and you could see by the rainbow that uh, uh, that was God's promise that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood, and he had a covenant with Noah. Oh, there we go. I guess i got to do it here, huh? <laughs> 
And then we see Abraham's covenant with God. And the Lord uh, walked, the Lord Himself walked this covenant. I want you to understand, this did not need Abraham. To, I showed you last week walking in the blood, and I'll show you that again today in just a little bit. But you see, the animals were put along the side. Their blood was allowed to flow into the center and that was normally where the two covenant partners would walk, standing in the blood. They would make the, the um, uh, covenant terms with each other, and that, then they would cut the covenant. Now that is cutting the covenant there. But in this case, God did not need Abraham. In fact, he got tired of Abraham chasing the birds away, and he made him go into a deep sleep. And God himself walked that covenant with himself. He was his own partner. And when he walked that covenant, he uh, uh, swore by himself because there was no higher to swear by. There was no higher. He swore by himself that it was an everlasting covenant. Everlasting covenant. So Abraham did not make this covenant with God. God made the covenant himself for Abraham. And then later on, God spoke to Abraham and Abraham was to accept this covenant by doing what? By circumcision. That was his acceptance of the covenant. But God himself made the covenant. And then, of course, as, as that's what we're talking about is the Abrahamic covenant. Nah, let's go here. And then the old covenant. And you see here, I don't know if you know, but the Chinese, how many have seen Chinese people that have the, they have the um, uh, red paper above their door and the red paper on the side. Maybe you don't know. They have a story about Nian. Nian meaning it was a monster that was up in the mountains and there was one time when the monster came down out of the mountains and killed all of the firstborn of the people of that village. Now think about the Bible story in Egypt and they were told the only way to keep this monster away and keep your firstborn alive is to put red above your doorway and red along the side of your doorways. You think the Chinese people never heard about God in, in the past? Oh my goodness, God is all the way through all of their language, through their characters and everything else. And so that uh, is uh, part of the, uh, applying the blood for the covenant. Then, of course, there's the Mosaic covenant in which Moses... Uh, brought the tablets down, and when he brought the tablets down, guess what the children of Israel doing? Exactly what they shouldn't be doing. They were worshiping uh, a false idol. He broke them. He went back up, and God again wrote with his finger upon the tablet. Think about that. God wrote twice upon that tablet. Jesus knelt down in the ground when the lady was brought to him, and he wrote twice on the ground. The Word, the Word was written by the Word on the ground. We don't know what he said, but oh my, I'm glad I wasn't one of the folks standing there. I'm absolutely glad that I'm not one of the folks that was standing there. And of course, there's the Davidic, co Davidic covenant where God made the covenant with David, and he said that uh, your seed and your son's seed, that, that, that it will never perish, and that out of thee shall come a ruler that shall rule my people Israel forever, okay? So, and, there, and then Melchizedek, and this was actually before that, Melchizedek brought bread and wine. I don't know if you remember the story, but Melchizedek came to Abraham, and he brought bread and wine for a covenant. Now, Melchizedek was without beginning, without end, without mother, without father. Gee, I wonder who he was. Christophany. He was, I believe, Jesus Christ. He was the king of Salem king of peace, he was Jesus Christ appearing to Moses. You say, well, that, I mean, to Abraham. You say, well, that's not possible. Yes, it is very possible because at another time, here came three men walking and one he called the Lord and the Lord spoke to him and said, you will have a child. Well, who else was that but Jesus Christ himself or Yahweh of the Old Testament? Now, there's the covenant between David and Jonathan. And I told you a little bit about that last week in which they, uh, Jonathan, being the suzerain or being the, the son of the king, he had the birthright to be king, and yet he decided of himself to give 
his birthright to David. I don't know if he knew exactly what he was doing, but he made a covenant with David, and that covenant is unbreakable. And the covenant that he made, he gave him his robe, he gave him his tunic, his general's tunic, he gave him his weapons of war and his belt, he gave him everything, the armor of the Lord. He became David's armor bearer, if you will. And then there's the marriage covenant. And, and I said last week, and I want you to understand, marriage is not a contract. If you aren't married yet, don't do it! No, if you aren't married yet, make sure you really understand you're making a covenant, and not just with that person, but you're making a covenant with God. And you need to be in that covenant, and you need to stay. Will God forgive you if you mess up? God forgives you if you come to Him in repentance for anything. But come on. Live by the covenant. And speaking of wedding covenants, the two shall be one. I don't know who they are. Man, I was a good-looking guy. Let's go, let's go on beyond that. And then a lot of people don't realize that baptism is accepting the blood covenant. When you walk into those waters of baptism, it is as though you are standing in the blood with your covenant partner. You are walking into the waters of baptism with Christ, with the Spirit of Christ. You are laying down your life. You are being raised again, a completely new person. It is a covenant, not a contract. It is not something you would say where you can say, today I'm a Christian and tomorrow, you know what, I don't really feel like it. It's time that Christians begin to understand exactly what it is that we're doing when we do doing these things. We're making a covenant with God, and we should never break the covenants that we make, especially when we make a covenant with God. Can you say amen? amen. Now, cutting the covenant I spoke last week, go on to the next one. The first thing is the exchange of the robe. And uh, Jesus promised us that he would give us a a new robe, a white robe that we would that we'd be all garbed in white. Amen. Go to the next one. The exchange of the belts. As I said, when when um, uh, Jonathan gave his belt to David, he wasn't giving him his belt that was holding up his britches, whatever whatever they wore for britches in those days. He was giving them his belt that was holding his weapons, and he was saying. I will fight for you no matter what battle you face. I will fight. He would have even fought against his own father for David if David would have asked for it. David didn't ask for it. David felt that it was wrong to fight against the anointed of the Lord. You know, it's a good thing that, there, that God doesn't treat people the way they got treated in the Old Testament because there's a whole lot of people that call themselves Christians that fight against the anointed of the Lord and speak against the anointed of the Lord that would be in a whole pile of trouble. I'm just saying. So. Now they cut the covenant, and I said last week they cut the, from, the, from the nose all the way down the back through the tail. They dig a ditch. They lay the, the, uh, the sacrifice on either side of the ditch. The blood flows down into the ditch. The two covenant partners then walk into the blood. I said marriage was a covenant. You have the, the groom's uh, uh, witnesses here. You have the bride's witnesses over here. That is your split sacrifice. They are sacrificing for this to happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are sacrificing for that wedding to happen. The bride comes and walks down this aisle, and it's as though she's walking through that blood. And in fact, in China, in a wedding, they use a red cloth, not a white cloth, because they're coming in through the blood. And the, the groom is standing here at the front waiting, and they stand together in that covenant blood, in between the two sacrifices. It's a covenant. Then the old, the old um, um, Semitic and actually the old, uh, they weren't Arabic in, the, in, the, in those days, but the, they were Arabic, they weren't Muslims. What's the word? A lot of different kinds. Okay, we'll say that. <laughs> but in either case, they would cut, and other than the Jewish people, they would actually cut and drink the blood. And they would say, I in you and you in me. The same thing, by the way, that's said in the wedding 
But you say, no, no, that's not said. Well, sure. What do you think you're doing when you're feeding her the cake and you're shoving it into her mouth? And she's feeding you the cake and she's shoving it in. I in you and you in me. Ooh, who else said that? Gee, I wonder, could it have been that Jesus said the same thing? Setting forth the terms of the covenant, the wedding covenant. I in you, you in me, even as I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Is it possible that he was setting forth a covenant? And then they exchanged names. Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new name that no man's going to know. Would you go to the next one? Then they make a scar. They make a scar, and what they do is they take the part where they cut with the blood, and they rub uh, a black kind of rock. It's a, it's a basalt rock or something like that. They rub it into that wound, and it becomes a scar, and that scar stays forever. It never goes away. So that when an enemy comes and wants to fight against me, I hold up my arm. Look who I've got. I've got me a, a suzerain. I've got me somebody with an army. You don't know how big their army is. You better stay away. Well, our covenant partner made the scars within his own body, Jesus Christ, made the scars within his own body to where he had uh, the wounds in his hand, the wounds in his feet, the stripes on his back, the bruised and bloody mess of, uh, uh, a mass of flesh hanging on the cross and people saying, well, but yeah, I'm a Christian today. Really? Go to the next one. Declaring the covenant terms. As I said, they stand in the blood. They have their arms entwined. They speak forth the covenant terms. This is what this, is what this covenant entails. And then they live by those covenant terms. The memorial meal, usually it was, or at least part of it, was wine and bread. Would you go on, please? And then there was the memorial tree, or in many cases, an altar was built. And many of those altars are still, the stone altars, I believe, are still in Israel. I've never been there like to go someday, but I got too many other things to do. Maybe when Jesus comes, I'll, I'll, I know I'll find time then. <laughs> Besides which, he could just go, and I'll be there. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, for God so loved the world that he made a covenant. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we've already been through that one. Let's go to the next one. And then we have in Isaiah 42, 6 through 7, where it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, speaking of Jesus, and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people and for a light of the Gentiles. Give thee for a covenant to the people and for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners out of prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house in Isaiah 42, 6, 7. And then in Luke 22, 20, it says, Jesus was sitting with his disciples, and it says, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament, testament meaning new covenant, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. It's not just a fairy tale, and I know most of you here tonight, maybe all of you, you already know the things that I'm bringing forth now, but I want you to get this deep down in your spirit when you're telling somebody else, let them know, Jesus made a covenant with you. He wants you to come into covenant with him, be his covenant partner. There is no greater covenant partner than Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? I mean, I could be your covenant partner, but everybody knows I'm a little bit flaky, so I... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and it came to pass, we're going to go to Genesis 22, 1 through 18. If you have your Bibles, you could open or you could follow along on the screen here. Um, I, I, well, go back to, yeah. Yeah, go back to verse 1. I don't know. Did I get two verse 1s? Two? No, I guess that's it. Okay. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. Abraham, uh, and said unto him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now let's stop there for just a moment. We know that Ishmael was born before Isaac, but Ishmael was a son of the flesh. He was a son because the wife uh, talked to Abraham. She said, look, the only, the only way you're going to have a child is if you go to my handmaiden. And so he did that. He had that child, but that wasn't the, the son of promise. 
Isaac was the only son of promise, and that is why God said to him, Take now thy only. By the way, that's one of the biggest fights between Israel and between the Muslims right now. But we are also the children of Abraham, but you're not the children of promise. And there's a very big difference between being the children of promise and being the children of somebody that got out of the will of God and did what he wanted to do because he wanted to have a child. Okay? Uh, but anyway, that's a different story. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now let me tell you, first of all, if anybody here thinks God's speaking to you to take your child and go to a mountain and, and have a sacrifice, tell me now, tell me now, please tell me now so that we could talk. Because I'm pretty sure God's not going to say that to you. But he said it to Abraham because it was to show forth that which he had promised, that which he would do, that which would come to pass, the very thing that he had walked through, though, uh, uh, walked into the blood, the, the, the burning furnace and the, and the torture, the flame, that had walked into the blood to keep as a covenant that he would do this. And then Abraham rose and, uh, up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for a burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Go to the next. And then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, and I, I'm going to tell you, I know we could use all different kind of, of translations and, 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 and so I like to study with some of them, but I really like the wording in the King James. I just, I just like it. And it doesn't word it this way in all, almost all the other translations I've seen. My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Think about how that could be read. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by its thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. God provides, as it is sent, said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, think about this now, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And I'll go to that, I'll come back to that in a little while. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Would you go to the next one, please? There is a saying, and I can't remember where it came from, but it says, the new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. There are many preachers today who say, well, you know what? We're living in the New Testament days. We don't have to preach from the Old Testament. I'm going to tell you now, you cannot understand covenant unless you go back into the Old Testament, unless you go back into the laws and the things that the Jewish people had, why they made the covenant or God made the covenant with them, why they accepted that covenant, why they did all of the things they did in the wilderness and in the tabernacle and all of those things. Unless you understand those things, you cannot really understand the New Testament, even though it seems so much easier to read. Why? Because there are things concealed in the Old Testament that when you become a Christian, hello, 
When you become, let me turn my, I thought maybe the Lord was speaking to me. That's why I got these, so I could hear better. <laughs> when you become a Christian, you begin to uh, uh, start to understand things. When you go back into the Old Testament and you start digging and you start digging and you start digging and you begin to look at why they had Passover, and, and you begin to go through the Jewish uh, traditions and everything of what they did during Passover, what they did at the tabernacle, what all the meanings of all the things of the tabernacle were, what all the meanings of the things that they did during Passover. Oh my goodness, it's unbelievable how much puts forth Jesus Christ. Did you know, and I'm going to stop just for a second here, did you know that in, in Passover um, seders, did you know that they have a, a bag that is, the, uh, afiko, that is the, the bag that holds the uh, matzah bread, that holds the unleavened bread. And there are three pockets inside that bag. Three pockets. You have a piece of bread in the top, a piece of bread in the middle, you have a piece of bread in the bottom. Part, oh, during the ceremony, they take out the middle piece of bread, they break it, they take half of that, and they put it in the afikomen bag. Afikomen means that which comes after. And they take that and they hide it, and it's not till later, at the end of the ceremony, that the children go and find it. And if you ask a Jewish person, why do you have three pieces of bread, three layers, they say, oh, it's just a, maybe it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Maybe it symbolizes them, or maybe it symbolizes the prophets, and, and so on and so on. No, 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 no. What about the Father and the Son and the Spirit? What else could it symbolize? And, and taking half of that afikom and breaking it, putting it in a bag, in a dark place, and hiding it, for the little children to go and find. Mm. Well, let's go. Take your only son. And so Abraham is here, and he's got his knife out, and he's ready to kill his only son, and an angel appears. I want to tell you how blessed Abraham is because Abraham, go ahead. First of all, Isaac, we already had that, so let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. He saw the place where he was to go. And Jesus was dead for three days. And then he, was and then he rose. Isaac carried the wood for the offering. And they went together. But Jesus carried the wood for his own cross. Isaac was not a little boy, in spite of what you, most of your stories tell you. Isaac was most likely between 30 and 33 years old, but he was very obedient to his father. Look, I, I wasn't all that obedient when I was younger. At 30, 33, if my father had said, come on, we're going to go and put you on an altar and offer you, I'm like, no, I don't think so. Jesus was around 33 years old, and God and did, did indeed provide himself. And... Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, began to offer him. Jesus was hung on his cross, and you've all seen this picture. You know, I had a vision many years ago, a vision of Christ on the cross. The only uh, vision that I've ever had in my life, I was not serving God. I wasn't living for God the way I should have been. I had not realized what a covenant was, and I had gone and done my own thing, and I came into a church, and I was in there that night praying, and I was there till three, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, and suddenly I had a vision of this. Long before the Passion movie ever came out, I had a vision of this, and the vision that I saw showed Jesus even bloodier than what you see here. I mean a bloody mess to where you could actually see his bones through his flesh, and they were rubbing salt into his wounds. I didn't understand. I said, God, the scriptures don't talk about them rubbing salt into Jesus' wounds. Well, actually they do if you go back into the Old Testament shall be a salt offering, and you were not to offer any offering to the Lord without adding salt to it. Jesus said, I'm the salt of the earth. And then he said, you're the salt of the earth. It would be nice if we would learn how to really be the salt of the earth, that this earth would be preserved instead of the darkness that is out there, that the light would begin to shine again, and we would begin to show forth the glory of God from his people, through his people, lighting up a dark and dying world. And the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham and said, For now I know that you fear God, seeing as how you have not withheld your own son, your only son from me. 
you know, God sent an angel to, to Abraham and he stopped him. We have an old song. He could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus could have, but he wouldn't. If he would have called 10,000 angels, 100,000, a million, a billion angels to come and to set him off the cross, they would have been ready to come. They would have been ready to come. But you know what they were doing? I believe with all of my heart. They were looking down and they were bowing down and they were worshiping and they were praising. Even though all of Israel was not doing it, the angels of heaven were silent and praising because of what was happening on that cross. Abraham saw a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And we know that Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head. Abraham offered the ram in the place of Isaac. Jesus was the substitutionary offering for you and for me. And the lion and the lamb. Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, and he said these words. He said, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. I don't know if you realize it, but the site of Solomon's temple was built on the very spot where Abraham offered Isaac to the Lord. On the very spot. Do you understand what that means? While Abraham was standing on the temple mount, he was looking this way. And he said, from the mount, it shall be seen. Do you know what's right across from that? The Temple Mount overlocked another smaller hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Jesus being crucified on Golgotha could be seen from the Temple Mount. And there is Golgotha. I've never been there. But I know that face. There is Golgotha. And if you stand on the Temple Mount, my understanding is that there are certain places where you could look across and you could see this hill. And in, the, in this place where Abraham sacrificed his son, he said, from this place it shall be seen. I believe that at that moment when he began to raise his knife and the angel stopped him and he began to sacrifice that ram, I believe with all of my heart that at that moment God began to bring revelation upon revelation upon revelation upon revelation into him and he saw Christ. You say, well, how can you say he saw Christ? Well, actually the scriptures say this. John 8.56 says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Where else could he have seen it unless it was where he said as he was standing in that place where he had gone to sacrifice his son, he said, from this place it shall be seen. He rejoiced. He was glad. Henceforth, it says in John 15, 15. Now, this is where I started talking last week about laying out the covenant terms. I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. I want you to notice when you make a contract with somebody, you may be partners, but you're also servants to each other. You are servants to each other, and you're bound by that contract and, 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 and you may not even like the person, but you're bound to them. Now, there's a whole lot of folks that don't like me. They better learn because they're going to be with me for a long time because I promise you I'm going to be in heaven. You make a contract with somebody, you're bound to them. And what if it's somebody that, well, somebody that smells bad, somebody that talks. Yeah. What if it's somebody that, killed somebody that's close to you. You have a contract with them. You're bound to that person. A person you can't stand. You're bound to them. Jesus said, go back to that, go back. Jesus said, but I don't call you servant. I don't call you partner. I call you 
friend. For all things that I've heard of my father, and friend, that's the thing that I told you. Jesus said last week, he said there is, or, or Proverbs, it says, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. A friend that sticketh closer to the brother is that covenant partner that we've been talking about for the last two weeks. The covenant partner that when you make a covenant with him, he is there with you through th thick, through thin, no matter what you face, he is there. You know the picture of footprints in the sand. One of my favorite pictures. One of my favorite pictures. Because when I was weak, when I can't stand anymore, when I feel like I've had my last breath and I, I'm not going to make it through another step, he picks me up and he carries me. He picks me up in his arms uh, and he gives me strength and he carries me through. Till I'm able to stand on my own again. He has never left me. He will never leave me. He has never left you. No matter what you have done, He's been there waiting for you to come right back. He's been there. But there's Christians who don't want to repent. There's Christians who don't want, oh, no, 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 no. Come on. He's always been there for you. And you can't Humble yourself enough to say, oh, my Lord, what have I done? Oh, my Lord, what have I done? I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Would you go to the next one, please? Jesus said these words. He said, greater love hath no man than this, that a, a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. And this is covenant. Listen. You are my friends if. If you don't know the word if. My fourth grade teacher used to say, if is a small word with a very big meaning. There's no other word in our language that has a bigger meaning than if. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Oh, let's go back to that. You are my friends. Give me my computer, please, would you please? The computer, not the tablet. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you to do. I want to show you what Jesus commands. Because there's people who say, oh, there's no commandments to us. We, there's nothing that we're commanded to do. All we got to do is bask in his love. All we got to do is bask in, in, in everything that he's already done for us. There is nothing left for us to do. He has done it all. Well, let's look and see. I hope I saved it. Let's look and see. If that is the case, he has done it all. Don't get me wrong, but he has given us commandments. The number one commandment that he's given us is in John 13, verses 34 and 35. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must, you must, he doesn't say you, you could if you want to. He says, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That is a commandment. It's not an option. Commandment number two, pray for your enemies. <laughs> that means I got to pray for, no. <laughs> Matthew chapter five, verses 44 through 30. I got to pray for my father-in-law. No. <laughs> Matthew chapter five, verses 44 through 45 says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That means if you have a, a senator, a, a congressman, a, a mayor, a president, whoever it is that you don't like, pray for them. If you think they're wrong, pray for them. Only God can change me. Only God can change you. Only God can change them. Pray for them. And if we do what we're supposed to do and love one another and pray for one another and pray for our enemies, oh my goodness, what God can do in this world through us and through them. And then he says these words, and boy, this is something that a lot of Christians don't like to do, but he says in Matthew 4, 17, he says, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As I said, 
if you've gone your own way, if you've done your own thing, you've given your heart to the Lord, you say you're a Christian, and I, and I understand that, but, but if you've gone your own way, you've done your own thing, and you think, you know, there's, I'm okay just the way it is, I could just keep going the way I am, it's okay. What you need to do is to follow the Scripture and repent and turn away from the thing. You've made a covenant with Him who did everything for you. He gave His life for you. Repent and continue your covenant with Him. I might never be asked back. I don't know. And then another command that Jesus gave us is believe that Jesus is in the Father. In John 14, 11, this is part of that covenant teaching, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And then later on he prayed, and he says that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, that I might be in you, even as I am in the Father, the Father is in me, that you might be in me. Oh my goodness, is that covenant or is that covenant? Then he said these words, and this is, this is what most Christians don't want to do today. Matthew 16, 24 through 25 says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him lay down himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let me tell you, folks, once you've given your life to Jesus Christ, it's no longer about you. It's no longer about you. It's about His kingdom. It's no longer about your will, my will. It's about His will. His will, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's about Him. It's all about Him. It's always been about Him. We just didn't know it. But now we've made a covenant with Him and we need to understand that it is about Him and we need to make it about Him and we need to make sure that everything we do gives Him glory and we need to begin to take up our cross and follow after Him and we need to begin to see what He sees and to, to weep over that which He weeps over. He looked at Jerusalem. He weeped over Jerusalem. He weeped over the world. The world is lost and dying and most Christians sin as though it doesn't matter. This is what was prophesied. It does matter. It does matter. Four and a half, five billion souls, six billion souls, whatever it is that are lost. Yes, but there's a billion. Yes, there's well, there's many that go to church, whether they're saved or not. Only God knows. Because he did say, there are those that will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have I not cast out demons in your name? Haven't I prophesied in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know you. Those are people who thought they, but they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't love. They wouldn't care about anything but themselves. They wouldn't see all that are lost in the world. They wouldn't go into the world, which is the next one, and make disciples. They wouldn't take up their cross and follow after him. All they wanted to do was to jump, to shout, to praise, to have a good time, to have a party, to do the programs, and to go home and live any way they wanted to live. But that is not covenant. When we make a covenant, we are making the greatest promise and more than a promise than we could ever make in our lives. We are joining ourselves together with the Lord. That's why the Israelites didn't like it so much when he said in, in John, he said, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. At John 6.66, 666, says these words, and many departed and followed him no more. I got it right this time, girls. I didn't say Luke, I said John. Many departed. And followed him no more. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, this is our purpose. It's not for us to get rich. It's not for us to say, give me, give me, give me. I want, I want. Ah! God, you promised. Come on. I promised my wife the sun and the moon and the stars when we met too. I took her out to the canal over there by Wareham, Massachusetts and cast out my fishing line, and I caught me a starfish. I said, here's the beginning of down payment. <laughs> Go and make disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. 
to the end of the age. And then he gave us this commandment, pray always. He didn't say to pray when you feel like it. He didn't say to pray when you have a need. He didn't say to pray uh, for a minute. It used to be sweet hour of prayer, but now it's just little talk with Jesus makes it right. He didn't say to just pray for a minute. He said to pray always. In fact, Jesus said these words. He said, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all those. Luke 21, uh, 36. Stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. In Luke, he, he instructs us to pray at all times. In Matthew, he instructs us not to use vain repetitions. In Luke, he, he again uh, instructs us to pray the Lord of the harvest for more laborers. In Luke, again, he, pro, he prays, uh, tells us to pray that we would not enter into temptation. In Matthew, he tells us to pray to the Father in secret. And in Luke, again, he tells us to pray for God's will and the kingdom to come for the forgiveness of our sins and for our needs. And again, he pray, tells us in Luke to pray for those who despitefully use us. He gives us all kinds of things all through the scriptures to pray for. You know somebody that's sick. You know somebody that's lost. You know somebody that's dying. You know somebody that's hurting. You know somebody that has a need. Pray for them and then go to them. Hallelujah. Become what Jesus is. The only Jesus they're ever going to see is the Jesus they see in you. Think about that. What kind of Jesus are they seeing? When the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to... They didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to heal. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to minister. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, anybody can stand behind here and be a fool for a space of time. But it takes somebody with real intestinal fortitude to get down on their knees, to get a hold of the hem of his garment, and to pray, and to pray, and to pray. It used to be calling glory down. People don't do that anymore. They wonder why the world is the way it is. Jesus came to fulfill all of the covenants of the Old Testament. And if you're not studying the Old Testament, if you're not reading and studying about covenants and the tabernacle and the, and the Passover and all of those things, I encourage you to get into some study and, and really begin in your Bible studies, in your home, uh, uh, if you're having, you should be having devotions with your family, get into talking about it and studying about it. Begin to find out what a covenant is. It will make your covenant relationship with the Lord stronger, and it will make your covenant relationship with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your mother, with your father, with your family, with your friends, with your pastor. It will make your, your covenant relationship stronger. And you will not even think about going to the right or going to the left. How could you think about that when you've got this covenant relationship with one that you love? With everything that's within you, you love him. You wouldn't want to do anything to hurt him. Covenant. David's covenant with Jonathan was so great that even after Jonathan's death, David kept his word. In the marriage vow, we say, well, till death do us part. And then a whole lot of people hope that death comes soon. <laughs> Think about that. Uh, I, I tell you, man, I, 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 January 25th, 2003, I started to develop this pain in my neck. Just coincidentally, that was our wedding day. No, I'm joking. A lot of people feel that way, though. They feel like their life is just terrible. But you made a covenant. And when you begin to pray, when we begin to seek God, when we begin to really, really, really renew our covenant with Him, then we're able to really understand what covenant is, and we're able to renew our covenant with our loved ones and with each other and with our church and with our members of our church and with our leaders of our church and with our pastors and with the Lord. We're able, I got to tell you, I came back from China six years ago to pastor in Colorado Springs. And I, 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 a Hong Kong businessman knew that I didn't have any money to buy a car. So he gave me money to buy a car. 
Think about that. Somebody give you money to buy a car. In fact, he gave me enough money that I bought. He wanted me to buy a new car, which you couldn't buy a new car with that amount anyway. But I, I, I bought a used car and a whole house full of furniture, too, because we didn't have any furniture. And he, he gave me money to buy a car. And so I went down to the car lot when I got into Colorado Springs. And, and the guy, the car lot guy, finds this car. And he says, this just came in today. And oh, this is so sweet. I believe that the angels brought this car here for you. That's what he said. I mean, this guy. I looked at him and I said, did you ever hear about covenant? He said, no, what about it? I said, well, in a covenant, they get split the animal down. They stand in the middle of the blood and they lay it on either side. And then they tell their covenant witnesses, as they make this covenant inside here, the promises, they tell the covenant witnesses, if I break this covenant, I didn't tell you this yet, did I? If I break this covenant, you can do this to me. And even worse, he looked at me. I've never seen anybody turn all shades of color like this man did. He was green, he was white, he was purple, he was blue, he was red. I mean, it went all the way down to his shoes. He turned around, he put his head on the car. He said, no, I don't think I want to do that. Well, we bought the car. And it did good by us. <laughs> the angel did put it there. <laughs> Covenant. Wasn't made to be broken. It wasn't made for you to walk away from. It wasn't made for you to take lightly. Covenant is something that you, that you put everything, as the signers of the Declaration of Independence that I read last week said, our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. When you're making a covenant with the Lord, you're laying your lives, take up your cross and follow after me. You're laying your fortunes, you're laying your sacred honor there on that cross. Whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want, Lord. It may not be what I've always thought that I wanted, but whatever you want, Lord. I thought I was going to be a chemistry and physics major. I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to find a cure for cancer and be famous. <laughs> whatever you want, Lord. I wonder how many of us have really understood the covenant that we have made. I wonder how many of us have really understood really understood in the depths of our being exactly how deep it is of what Jesus did for us and how it was purposed that we would have a covenant relationship. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Is there any more left on that PPT? We're going let, to, let's close it out. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I've made a covenant with Jesus Christ, a real covenant with Jesus Christ. How many, I'm not asking you if you're a Christian now. Now hear me. I'm asking you how many of you have really made a covenant with Jesus Christ. Okay, now put your hands down. How many would say, well, I haven't made a covenant, but I am a Christian? Tonight I'm asking you to make a covenant with the Lord. I'm asking you because... When you, give, when you ask the Lord to come into your heart, that's technically what you did, even though you didn't know that you were doing it. You were making a covenant. And I'm asking you tonight to stand up and to really allow that covenant to be part of your life, that you're going to allow Him to be in you in a greater way than ever before, and you're going to turn around and you're going to walk into Him, which is a greater infilling of the Spirit than you've ever known before. You're going to turn around and walk into Him, and you're going to be everything that He has called you to be. If that's what you want, stand. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Hallelujah, Jesus. Covenant. When you make this covenant with him, and as I say, many of you have already given your heart to the Lord. If you have never given your heart to the Lord, if you've never given your heart to the Lord, but tonight you want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you want to make this covenant with him, never given your heart to the Lord, raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Jesus is going to save you tonight. He's going to change your life. doesn't matter whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're pretty like me, whether you're ugly. 
you've never made a covenant with the Lord, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, you know you need Him. You know you need Him. Oh, don't, don't you try to lie to me. You know you need Him. Raise your hand and let me pray with you. God's going to save you tonight. Change your life. Never, never ask Jesus into your heart. Did? And those that said you want to make a covenant with the Lord even greater, raise your hands high. Greater than ever before. I want all of you to get out of your seats now. Get out of your seats now. Don't wait for somebody else. If you wait for somebody else, you might miss your blessing. Get out of your seat now and come here. Sister Patty, come and help me pray, please. Hallelujah. Brother Layton, Sister Layton, come and help me pray, please. Sister Moffat, come and help me pray, please. Sister, Sister Langevin, I'm going to need you to help me pray too, okay? Hallelujah. Let me pray with you first. Dear Lord, this night, yes, Lord, we've accepted you as our Savior. Yes, Lord, we believe that you are Lord, that there is none beside you. Yes, Lord, we've, uh, we've uh, been in uh, serving you and worshiping you for such a long time. But this night, Lord, we're beginning to understand covenant in a way maybe that we've never understood it before. And this night, oh Lord, this night, oh Lord, we come to you opening ourselves up totally and completely, Lord. We're, we're laying aside everything that maybe we've held back, things, Lord, that we've held on to. This night, Lord, we're giving everything up to be like you, you in us, us in you that the world may see who you really are, that the world may see you in us.